he made a mistake, left something behind in sort of his frenzy, um, and then walked out of there, leaving a key piece of evidence. And, and I'm glad that he did. Welcome to the global phenomenon, surviving the survivor, where we're all just trying to survive in a rough world. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor. Uh, we bring you the best guests in true crime, and as you'll see, today is no exception. There is a lot of news, a lot of ground to cover. Uh, seven weeks and five days since the brutal quadruple homicide happened, and now we're finding out chilling details about the night of those four homicides, including the fact that one of the surviving roommates said, and I quote, there's someone here. Very creepy to hear that. Investigators say they believe the homicides occurred between 4 and 4.25 a.m. on November 13th. And now really three main questions uh, remain. Why? Number two, why did he spare the two roommates? Number three, does this suspect still have the murder weapon and where is that murder weapon want to remind everyone especially since we do have a lawyer on the panel that brian koberger is presumed innocent until proven guilty in a court of law of course the show is all about the victims let us never forget those young lives lost way too soon madison mogan 21 kaylee gonzalez 21 zana kernodal 20 ethan chapin 20 and now to our esteemed panel Starting off with Dr. Shiloh, the woman with the black curtain behind her, is a forensic and police psychologist. She began her professional career as a police officer with a small Southern California agency, primarily conducting patrol duties, but also worked as a background investigator and was the department's terrorism liaison officer, often training with the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force. While working as a police officer, she can multitask. She earned her graduate degrees and began training law enforcement throughout the country on forensic psychology topics such as PTSD uh, in critical incidents and the psychology of sex offenders. And she hosts a very popular podcast, L.A. Not So Confidential. John Muffler, without the tie on, is a principal of Equitas Global Security an accomplished law enforcement professional with more than 28 years experience in the field and with an emphasis on leadership and high-level security matters. He holds the distinction of being certified in threat management by the Association of Threat Assessment Professionals, and he served as United States Marshal uh, in their service as the administrator of the National Center for Judicial Security. And the distinguished gentleman in the blue tie is Dale Carson, son of former Jacksonville Sheriff Dale Carson, he had a distinguished career in law enforcement as a Miami-Dade County police officer and a special agent of the FBI. In the FBI, Dale served as an instructor in interrogation and sex crimes at the famed FBI Academy in Quantico. He also served as a member of the FBI Special Weapons and Tactics SWAT team. He then went on to get his law degree from Florida Coastal School of Law and is the author of Arrest Proof Yourself, the Indispensable Guide to Avoiding Unnecessary Arrests and Interactions with Police. Um, I just quick reminder for everyone to please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Patreon, on Twitter. We are at Podcast STS. And as my eight-year-old daughter says, please hit that like and subscribe button because it gets the al algorithm cooking. Now, uh, Brian's initial appearance was yesterday. We're recording this on Thursday, but it will air first thing Friday morning. Uh, no bail for Brian Koberger. Uh, his attorney did ask for it. The judge denied it. Uh, any surprise there to you, counselor, to you first, Mr. Carson? None whatsoever. I mean, most states have an arrangement where if someone's charged with a capital offense, which this is, it can be executed if he's found guilty of these crimes, that there's no requirement under the Florida State Constitution, I mean, the state, uh, federal constitution, to allow them to be released on bail. Um, we were also told that while the names of the victims, as we just did, while they were being read, uh, families were crying, very emotional, Dr. Shiloh, you're the psychologist. I mean, that is obviously what is expected. We just, on our last episode, 
interviewed Carrie Rawson, the daughter of the infamous BTK killer. She's still dealing with the horror of all that 18 years later. Um, this, the families in all of this, uh, both the suspect and the victims, are going to be going through quite a bit, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and everyone's going to deal with their various perspectives of trauma in a different way. Um, I think when we look at courtroom behavior, because it is so underneath a microscope, we tend to be very judgmental about people's behaviors when we really shouldn't be um, either now, really early on in the process, or months down the line, years down the line, however long this is going to take, because people are going through this trauma, anyone's family, um, and even the perpetrator. You know, we give a lot of uh, weight to how a perpetrator looks or acts during court proceedings. And this is a long, arduous process. Um, and we can't really gain a whole lot from what some people might sort of take away from that. But it doesn't surprise me at all that there's already some emotional um, attributes being seen in court. And uh, John Muffler, you uh, were a U.S. Marshal. It means you took a lot of bad guys into custody. The next status hearing we found out will be in one week. Um, we understand that the suspect, Brian Koberger, has requested vegan meals in jail. Uh, what is his life in jail going to be like, uh, not just till the next case hearing, uh, but in general for the coming weeks and months? Well, he will be um, in isolation. I mean, it's a small, it's a small jail attached to the courthouse, which is a good thing because it'll it adds an extra level of security since there won't be any uh, you know commuting back and forth. Um, but as far as his his day to day life, it'll be uh, very isolated. He'll be watched, if not twenty four seven. Of course, he's going to be confined twenty four seven. He may have officers outside his jail cell. Um, uh, on, you know, continuously, but he won't have any freedom within there. Um, he will be watched. I think there was a death threat uh, posed on him when he was in Pennsylvania in, in jail there. So, you know, he's a mark for someone, um, you know, and, uh, you know, within the jail system, uh, the bigger, the better. Um, you can make a name for yourself within those kind of environments by carrying out an assault by someone that popular. So um, for many reasons, um, he will be in isolation. He's still under suicide watch too. So um, he will be secluded and, and you know, with limited, limited, um, you know, availability to do anything um, without restraints. Let's dive right into this probable cause affidavit. It was unsealed. Uh, there were chilling recollection of voices overheard on the night of the murders back on November 13th. Police, police say they identify Brian Koberger through a combination of DNA evidence at the scene, cell phone records, and Koberger's white Hyundai Elantra, which we had heard about that bolo. Uh, this, of course, all according to this uh, now unsealed probable cause affidavit. Again, uh, Counselor Carson, to you, uh, we're going to go through a kind of step by step, but anything jump out at you in particular when you saw the contents of this affidavit? Well, absolutely. The DNA is the real solution to the investigative problem here. Had they not found the DNA, this would have been doubly difficult. I think it's been pointed out on many other shows that one of the interesting pieces of this is the, the vehicle that he drove. And that vehicle, of course, we didn't get any direct reports in the media about whether or not that someone was calling and saying, that's my car, don't worry about it. So we knew pretty early on that it was the car involved. And the police suppressed, as they, well they should, that information so that the individual who actually owned that car and was traveling in that car wasn't alerted in advance. But I will tell you this, not everything that the government knows against him is in that affidavit. That's only a tiny part of a probable cause affidavit for an arrest warrant. It is not the indictment, and it is not the full breadth of what they know about him or are able or willing to prove. And the investigation would continue for many months after this. There's a lot of evaluation. The defense has an opportunity to go into that house 
and verify for themselves whether or not it's an accurate reflection of what the property looks like, where the evidence was collected, all those sorts of things. So this is going to be a real, well, it's going to be a conflict as it is in adversarial work. But I will tell you this, the prosecutor has one tool that they can use to make him plead to this case. I mean, we're all expecting a trial, but that may not occur because oftentimes the prosecutor will allow him to plead guilty and to avoid the death penalty. So those are things, prospects for us to look toward in the coming months and weeks. In addition to which, it's unlikely that that trial is going to occur there. There's little doubt that there will be a jury bias just percolating through that community such that it's likely if there is a trial, it won't be held in Moscow. So you're expecting a change of venue. How uh, how quickly could a plea deal come in a case like this? Is there I mean, is there any way that next week we could hear this this guy or is it a process? Well, it's a process because first off, as a defense attorney, you want to get the discovery. That's all the information, including Brady material, which is anything that might argue towards his innocence. You've got to review that. You've got to do your due diligence or you're going to get a bar complaint afterwards. So once that's done, it can sometimes require depositions. Now, I'm not familiar with Idaho law. I don't know. Maybe some of your other guests are. But in Florida, we are allowed to perform what are known as depositions. And those depositions involve sitting with a potential witness and asking questions. The focus is not to catch them in a lie. The focus is simply to get information that if they deviate from that testimony when they're on the stand, we can use that to impeach their credibility. So those are really important factors. I don't know whether that happens in Idaho. For example, it's very difficult to interview in deposition format an FBI agent or a U.S. Marshal. The, the, the government just, because it's a separate sovereign, will deny that request to do deposition work with federal employees. So this is going to be a process, and I look for there to be certain revelations that come forward. And, and of course, when there's more evidence piled up against somebody, and that's one of the things that the FBI and other agencies are really good at. In FBI cases, we didn't have typically one witness. We had 48 witnesses. And a juror might look at that and go, well, the first one, I don't trust that witness. The next one, I don't trust this witness. But about the 38th witness, you're just going, yeah, that that puddle is probably guilty. So mm -hmm. I would expect that type of trial if it does, in fact, proceed to that level. Otherwise, and certainly they, they will have to show other, other in, in, in Florida, it's called HEW, where someone is really brutal. And if they're really brutal in a killing, which this clearly manifests that character, then there are accelerants that allow them to proceed very quickly to the death penalty. So that's going to be foremost in the lawyers, the defense attorneys' minds. And therefore, they're going to be vying for an opportunity to let him plead to a lesser offense, provided the evidence is sufficient to sustain a conviction. And if they're able to do that, then you can look for a plea. Um, Counselor Carson pointed out that this probable cause affidavit is just a part of it. And I want to point out that part of it was actually redacted. So it's a fraction of what we're seeing uh, when you break it down that way. I want to read a part of this affidavit. This is from a police officer, and John, I'll get your reaction, and Dr. Chilo, uh, that's only been active, I believe, for four years. And this is from his voice. And he writes, I could see two females in the single bed in the room. Both Gonsalves and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side when viewed from the door. The sheath was later processed and had K-Bar USMC and the United States Marine Corps Eagle Globe and anchor insignia stamped on the outside of it. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA the from the suspect profile left on the button snap of the knife sheath. I mean, this is jaw-dropping. Uh, Dr. Shiloh, to you first, 
uh, people, you know, profilers were pinning this guy as quote unquote, uh, you know, brilliant mind, et cetera, et cetera. This is a, a mistake that a novice felon wouldn't make. But were you surprised to hear this fact? Um, I don't know if I was surprised to hear it. I think we're giving the defendant way too much credit, you know, to say that this is somebody just because he's in a PhD program or what have you, that he's this, you know, evil genius in the way that we unfortunately glorify offenders these days. Um, but I think it's a huge mistake. And I think continuing to either using your own car in the crime and continuing to drive that car in the crime is also something that kind of seems like offender 101 mistakes. Um, so, you know, it's it being that this is someone that I think it's probably their first offense, first violent offense, um, being in the moment and being so caught up in it, it doesn't surprise me in that vein that he made a mistake, left something behind in sort of his frenzy, um, and then walked out of there leaving a key piece of evidence. And and I'm glad that he did. Yeah. And John, to you, is this what you expect criminals to do to screw up and leave uh, key pieces right. of evidence behind? Well, you, you hope they do. And he did. And I read the affidavit line for line um, before we came on. And and I just want to connect with some things that um, Dale said, like what's not in that affidavit. But what's in that affidavit is stunning. Um, when I love the fact, I mean, I love the Bureau's work. I love the Idaho uh, law enforcement work. I love the connection with the DNA on the sheath to the trash pull from the parents' house to connect the father's DNA back to the defendant. So that's that's substantial. That's really great detective work. And that's that's a game changer. I also, going back to what's not in the affidavit, or what's in the affidavit, to tell you what's not in the affidavit that's coming, the prosecutors will likely gather, and we did this with, obviously, with, uh, you know, uh, pursuing fugitives, is, you know, the 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 electronic, the signals, the IP addresses, all of that is addressed in the affidavit of where he was where, and when he was turning off his phone. But it shows in the affidavit that at least 12 times since he got that phone number or that phone in June, he was in the area of the King Road residence. So he's showing pre, he's showing stalking behavior. Of course, we don't know why yet, and I'm very interested to find out the why to all of this. Um, but that's an, that's a very interesting catch. So again, why them? And so with the cell data and the information they have, they'll be connecting victims and other folks to those uh, that information. So I think there's a lot more information that I'm sure they're working on as far as the data and the connectivity to that stalking behavior, to at least one, of course, he, the defendant in this case is, is uh, accused with killing four, but you know, who was the connection? Was there one p- potential um, stalking victim? Were they all stalking victims? So that is a very interesting piece that I'm looking forward to finding out because you know, obviously his, the pre-incident behavior is telling and uh, I want to know what those other connections are with with that information, that electronic information. And we're going to get a little more into the phone records, but they do show that since June 22nd, Brian Koberger had been near the murder house at least 12 times prior to the murders. Those visits were typically in the late evening or early morning hours. Um, Dale Carson, to you, I got this from uh, a friend of the show who's a retired FBI uh, year old uh, neck of the woods. Um, this is in response to Brett Payne. Corporal Brett Payne is the one who wrote this probable cause affidavit with just four years experience. And uh, Jeff sent this to me saying they use a rarely junior officer four years on the force to file the affidavit. This is a ploy in order to keep most of their evidence away from the defense team until discovery. This is done to help keep the officer from revealing too much information during a hearing. We've done this in my cases. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Can you explain oh, that have, a little bit? I absolutely do. And and as you'll notice, there are no names of any agents 
their position, what they did, how many years they were on is listed. But again, that gets back to the fact that they don't want deposition work done against the witness, potential FBI agent witnesses. And that's just standard in the industry. Ultimately, based on Idaho state law, it'll come to fruition if there's an actual trial. If there's not a trial, the FBI and the U.S. Marshal Service play really close to the vest when it comes to their investigative strategies. Like following a car across the country can't be facilitated by you and I in a pickup truck with caps on following him, right? <laughs> I mean, it's done in a very sophisticated way, and I could go into that, but I won't here, but there are ways and manners in which this is accomplished, and you certainly don't want to reveal that. But I have a a theory about why he was spending time there. And I'd love your other guests to, to speak to this if they would. I'm convinced that the house, the back of the house, was facing a fraternity. And there was a small hillock in the back. And if you drove to that location, you could look directly in the windows for the two upstairs apartments and the two mid-level apartments. Okay. You could see into the windows. And there's no doubt that voyeurs tend to behave this way. They find an opportunity and they will spend hours and hours watching inside the house, which may actually explain why he couldn't from that back see that the downstairs were inhabited. So he wouldn't even know that those people were there when he's trying to make a plan about all of this. So that's a real possibility here. Excuse me just a second. Phone still oh. ringing while I'm working. <laughs> it never stops. Well, let me go to uh, Dr. Shiloh to pick up on that. Um, the counselor suggests maybe this was a voyeuristic act that uh, spiral spiraled out of control. Have you given any thought to motive? Um, why he did this? I mean, that's still the uh, sixty-four million dollar question. Yeah, definitely, and I think. Um... You know, I know you've asked other guests if you could ask, get the answer to one question, what would it be? And for me, it's still what is the connection to these victims? Because I think that will put absolutely everything in perspective. We don't have enough to get that yet. And I think as to, you know, his presence at that location in at least 12 times, I'm going with the, the limited amount of information that we have right now with um more of surveillance and intel and recon re <laughs> reconnaissance behavior, excuse me, um, rather than maybe voyeuristic behavior. I don't see anything that we don't have any information yet that any of these murders were sexually motivated. Um, voyeurism is typically a paraphilia, a sexual disorder. And where you have one paraphilia, you usually have two others. They tend to travel in threes. So I just don't feel like we have that information yet. Maybe that will come up, um, but I'm still looking at it from like a surveillance intel gathering perspective at this point. And I think just, I know this is splitting hairs, but I also purposefully stay away from the term stalking because stalking is a whole other set of behaviors when we're looking at that as a crime that is meant to tell the victims, I'm here, I'm harassing you, I'm invoking distress and fear in you. And clearly at this point, we don't know that any of these victims knew he was even there. So I, I don't think we can call it true stalking in that sense, but certainly like stalking prey in, in that layman's term for sure. And John, to you, uh, circling back, since you raised the point about cell phones, uh, Jeff Wood, former FBI, sent this to me too. He wrote, uh, they used CAST, C-A-S-T, which is an FBI resource where agents have been trained to track cell tower pings to track him around the victim's house leading up to the night of the murder. Then they show him leaving his house, heading there, turning off the phone, and then after leaving, turning the phone back on. We've used this technique in other cases in Boston, so I'm well aware of how valuable CAST is. I mean, how important was technology in apprehending this guy? And it appears that after the murders, he went back to the home roughly nine in the morning or so, according uh, to this affidavit. Uh, why do you think he returned? Was it to check on the scene? 
Yeah, I think maybe to check on uh, what happened, um, maybe if, you know, if, if, if the bodies were found yet, maybe for his own morbid curiosity. Um, but the fact that he, the, the phone was on and off, um, you know, speaks volumes to me. You know, you, you, you turn it off or you leave it behind as, as, uh, as an excuse or some sort of weak alibi that, no, I wasn't there. My phone was in, in Washington. You know, I was in Washington, therefore, right? So it's it's a weak alibi, but it's used quite a bit. And the agent uh, that you were just uh, mentioning, I mean, he's familiar with that too. So again, it's 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 very easy to track whereabouts with the with the with the phones, with the cell towers, um, et cetera. So um, I think his the behavior um, leading up to it and afterwards, you know, really kind of is indicative of someone who's. Um, you know, conducting pre-operational surveillance and um, looking to find a way to, um, you know, for lack of a better term, execute their plan. Councilor Carson, garbage played a role in this. Agents took trash from Koberger's home in Pennsylvania, sent it to the crime lab in Idaho, and that is how the DNA match with DNA from the knife sheath was made, according to the affidavit. Um, as a defense attorney, uh, this is scientific evidence that's pretty strong. How do you defend against it? Well, I mean, you have to defend the validity of the, the actual search warrant and its affidavit. That's how you get rid of that. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation that they were able to obtain the DNA from that, as we now know, the knife sheath, and use that. Uh, in the public databases in order to connect the families. But I suspect once they discover where the car was and that the car was involved in likely the car, they knew that there was a family member in Pennsylvania. And it's a fairly simple matter to do a trash pull. I mean, the marshals do that all the time. We do that all the time. And uh, look in the garbage. You find all kinds of things because people expect the garbage to make it disappear. And of course, it doesn't disappear. But let me, while we're on this subject, let me mention too that although the tracking with cell phone tower pings is really valuable in a circumstance like this, it helps us identify perpetrators and find justice for these poor victims. It is also a problem for everyone else in the country because we are able to be tracked no matter where we are or what we're doing. And it really impinges on individual freedom and privacy in a way that was never and contemplated by the founding fathers or contemplated, frankly, by us. I mean, we thought that our, the fact that you could monitor us and see where we were was probably a good thing. If you've lost your child, it's probably a good thing. But I, Long term, I'm not sure that that's in everyone's best interest. And that's just a personal opinion. I'm curious to get all three of your responses to what I'm about to ask next. And we can start with uh, John. Um, according to Africa David, they did find two footprints, but apparently there's no mention anywhere of a blood trail. So there's a lot of debate. Um, did this guy injure himself or not? In these traffic stops that we see, people have surmise they've zoomed in on his right hand they say it looks like it was banged up but um john what do you make of the fact that they did find these two footprints but there's no mention of a blood or a blood or a blood trail yeah i mean it's interesting because you know the blunt force trauma i mean it's an edged weapon used on all four um you know there's going to be a lot of blood so it, it is interesting that that was not in the affidavit i'd imagine there was i mean i've seen we've seen pictures from outside the house with the blood leaking outside of from the inside to the outside so there's a tremendous amount of blood loss at that scene and for there not to be a trail is kind of unusual um but just because i said that that doesn't mean there wasn't some blood trail it's just maybe not mentioned in the affidavit dr shiloh your thoughts um is it possible he committed this without injuring himself this crime um I I think, you know, he very well could have been injured, but to sort of cradle your hand in your clothing and walk out without dripping your own blood is certainly feasible. It's just surprising to me that there's not more of a trail of blood of footprints or victim um, blood there, but it, it doesn't surprise me that, 
you know, perhaps he was injured, but was able to keep that from, you know, dripping on the ground. And Counselor Carson, is it possible we're just not uh, privy to this in the affidavit or what What do you think? Well, I mean, they said the thing, the footprint from the shoe, which he may have shoes like that, they may be able to connect that as well, was outside in the dirt. They didn't say anything about blood prints. But I can tell you, I've handled a number of stabbings. I've seen stabbings. And the concept that a person bleeds out is only true if their heart's still beating. So if the heart's not bleeding, there's no blood pressure. The flow is from gravity. And there, I have questions as to whether or not, and I know it's horrific. Don't misunderstand me. And my heart goes out to the family. Uh, and many people would disagree with this statement. But just because they've been stabbed doesn't mean there's, there's so much blood there that he could never, he could avoid it. And insofar as him injuring himself, you know, if he's wearing gloves, which apparently he was based on the information we have, and he was using a knife with a shield to protect his hand from going down on the blade itself, it's quite possible he didn't injure himself. Though there is information, as you may know, that there was an effort by one of the individuals, we don't yet know who, to defend themselves. So in a defense situation, Typically, you have a reaction to that, and that reaction can often put under your fingernails DNA from the suspect. And quite frankly, that's where I thought it could come from originally. I was kind of surprised that that sheath was left, but it only had on the snap some DNA. And I want you to think about this for a minute. I've given it a little bit of thought. What a great way to put us off on who the assailant is. If you get a K-Bar knife, it's got U.S. Marine Corps on it, you think immediately it's got to be somebody who is suffering from PTSD, and it sends you down the wrong track. So we don't know what this guy was thinking. I don't know what he was thinking, but it's evident that he got prepared. He was there 12 times looking in the back of that house, most in my view, and the result is that he targeted these individuals and may have never had a direct connection with them. But I've got to believe that in a college setting with windows that open into that back area, that he and others would know that there was a potential view out that window. And as the doc will probably agree, men are visually driven. And so it's a little different when someone watches you once or twice, but 12 times being in that area tends to lead me to believe that there was a, not necessarily a but not necessarily a personal relationship, but certainly one that is typical of the internet today, right? Where we think we know people, we see them. The, the, the groups in this house promoted a bunch of videos, dancing around and having a great time, which is all well and good. And I, I don't fault anybody for that. But when you put yourself out on the internet, you don't know who's using what when in a virtual relationship, which many people begin to have now with the internet, is certainly something that we've got to analyze to determine whether that's appropriate for people or does that put them in harm's way. And uh, I spoke to a Navy SEAL today who was issued a K bar knife in the military. There was a lot of speculation that it was, in fact, a K bar knife when this story first broke. And now we know, it, in fact, it was. Um, what he said to me is interesting. He said he wants to know more about the suspect's father. Uh, Dr. Shiloh, is that something you're interested in as well? Um, he was alluding to the fact that maybe the father was Marine, but uh, is it of interest to you to know the family dynamics to get a better understanding of Coburger? Yeah, I think the family dynamics is going to be important if I were uh, the forensic psychologist doing perhaps an evaluation, competency to stand trial or something like that with this offender, you would definitely want to get some self-report from the defendant themselves, um, but also collaterally be able to interview family members and see if and how that could be relevant to upbringing, childhood development, um, or in this case, if you're kind of alluding to, was this, did the father have a military history? Was, did this weapon even belong to the defendant or was it a family, um, uh, article? 
So all of that's going to be very, very important. I think at this point, I don't have mm. any suspicions about the father, perhaps, but um, but that just needs to be further explored. And John, uh, uh, Moscow. Yeah, just real, quick, just real, real quick, though, sure. on the knife. And I just, again, I don't want to speculate, but just the knife, the Marine Corps, you know, as, as an investigator, I think they want to look at, and I'm sure they're looking at, does he have that identification, that warrior sign of identification where he's, you know, wants to be someone that he's not. Um, so I don't know, you know, again, I'm speculating here, but the, the, that, the K bar USMC knife, you know, again, I'm just asking a question. Is that an indicator of a warrior kind of identification mindset? I don't know. I think that's a good point. What, yeah. What do you think, Dr. Shiloh? We don't know if it's a genuine, uh, Marine Corps issued cable or it could be like a knockoff he bought. But what about the fact that he is using that um, to John's point, Dr. Shiloh, is he yeah. trying to be something, someone he's not? Well, I mean, when we look at the path of violence, when we're talking about different um, mass violence attacks or targeted violence attacks, it is one of the common denominator denominators that we see. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it could totally be a knockoff. It doesn't matter. It's what it represents to the person. And, um, you know, I think that's a very, very good thought here. You know, when we're looking at, is, is this person who was someone who was grievance driven? I don't know. That's something I've toyed with throughout this whole thing, because usually they want their message to be heard and be known when they commit a horrific mm -hmm. offense like this, especially when we look at, um, mass casualty events, um, or mass murders and, you know, he snuck out the back door. He didn't leave a legacy token or a manifesto mm -hmm. um, saying why he was doing this and come get me. Doc, Dr. Carson was the same line. Yeah. You know, it, the, the bodies weren't apparently staged in any way, which is another, you know, key to that sort of sexual behavior that you mentioned earlier. And I, and I don't think there's any indication of that in this particular case. And I do find it odd that there was no apparent sexual molestation in this case. But of course, we don't know what other kind of DNA evidence may have been recovered. You know, it's not unusual for sex offenders to um, masturbate in a situation like this. And we will have to wait until all the evidence is analyzed to determine whether that's a potential factor. Attorney, uh, Carson was taking notes. I hope it wasn't to his assistant to say, don't ever put me on this podcast again. But <laughs> there, was a, there was a bolo for the uh, Hyundai Elantra that was issued now about four or five weeks ago. Um, a review of camera footage indicated that a white sedan hereafter suspect vehicle one was observed traveling westbound in the 700 block of Indian Hills Drive in Moscow at 5, uh, approximately 3.26 a.m. and westbound, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Carson, Vi this kind of video evidence, is this easy or hard to debunk as a defense attorney? No, no, I think it's very difficult to debunk. I mean, but it is a problem that we really don't understand the dynamic of single level photographs or video. Because is it true? Is it not true? Can it be fabricated? Yes, all those things are possible. But we as a culture use that as direct evidence, and we believe it when we see it. And part of that, in my mind, and maybe Dr. Shiloh can speak to this, we've become so accustomed to seeing things on TV that are not real, that in we do see things on the, the DVDs or, or the videos of cars or people, we have a, a, a certain behavior that allows us to suspend disbelief and look at that and believe that it's true, even though it may not be. And so that's always a problem. It's very difficult to get jurors to go to suspect the authenticity of film. This next part of the uh, probable cause affidavit is the sort of the heart of darkness of, of it. Um, two roommates, Bethany Funk and Dylan Mortensen, uh, whose rooms were on the first and second floors, they survived. Um, this part is very chilling. I'd like you to all weigh in. 
uh, and I'll read a little bit of this. Um, a short time later, Dylan Mortensen said she heard who she thought was Gonsalves saying something to the effect of, there's someone here. One of the surviving roommates opened her door after she heard crying and, quote, saw a figure clad in black clothing that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. The witness described the figure as five foot ten or taller male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. After seeing the figure, the witness went back into a room and locked the door. She did not say that she recognized the male. First to you, Dr. Shiloh, already, and it, it's it's jarring to me and, and sad because this is a situation no one can ever imagine themselves in. Uh, Dylan Mortensen's already taking heat. I, I see on social media that she, you know, ran and locked herself in the door. But what about the chillingness of hearing there's someone here, this figure clad in black? What do you make of all this? Yeah, it's it's horrifying and it's absolutely heartbreaking. And it doesn't shock me with the way people are now, especially online, that she's catching grief for this. But she absolutely should not be. Um, all of her actions, you know, we, she talks, there's a, a quote in there where she said she was in a frozen shock phase. And I think people only think of when faced with fear of fight or flight. And we have to remember there are six different mammalian defense mechanisms that as very lizard brain human beings, when we are looking out for our best interest or to not die in a moment that we might go to any one of these and it's not really within our control. This is, um, evolution has not been able to let us move past going into some of these defense mechanisms. You have avoidance of threats, which is just avoiding everything all the time. Um, you have attentive immobility, which is freeze. You have withdrawal, which is flight. You have aggressive defense, which is fight. You have appeasement, which is where you try to cater to the threat. Um, and then tonic immobility, where you simulate being dead. And if, if you think about in our caveman days, if we were faced with a lion that wanted to kill and eat us, you know, fight, flight, or freeze, you're probably not going to outrun a lion. You're probably not going to win a fight with a lion. But if you hold really still behind a tree, they might pass you by. And this is exactly the type of mode that her body went into at this time. And then it was, okay, lock the door, you know, secure myself away from the threat as much as possible. Um, you know, I think we have to remember there's a lot of physiology happening in the body when you're faced with a threat like this. And without training, again, you can't really choose to just override how you think and how you act. Or we can't sit here and say how we would think or act in that moment because you just don't know unless you've been there or unless you've trained for it over and over again. Even law enforcement agencies right. don't train to the extent that they actually should for these moments. So, you know, I, I think that on top of just how we react to trauma or a situation like this is based on the situation, but also us individually, what are we bringing to the table? Sure. What past trauma do we have? What, how, what is our sort of normal, natural resiliency? Like, um, what are our past experiences like? So, you know, this, this, young lady was acting exactly like she needed to in the moment and probably saved her own life. I agree. And if I can just jump in, um, you're, you're talking about orientation there a little bit and your orientation is different for all of us, depending on our culture, uh, you know, family life, uh, personal life, and, and all those things that we bring into how we operate day to day. And then, you know, that orientation um, is impacted. And so, you know, you know, there's several hours of a, you know, a gap. And I, I, you know, I haven't seen the social media, but I understand what it's probably about. Um, you know, I was having a similar conversation. So, you know, again, going back to what the doctor said, I, I imagine behind that locked door, she is fearing for her life. Um, and, you know, doesn't maybe doesn't know that he actually left the house. 
you know, so, um, you know, we don't know. We don't know her past life. You know, maybe she was a victim. So there's so many things in play. And I understand more now the delay um, of calling, you know, 911. Um, but, yeah, I would say give her a break because uh, there's, there's way more involved being a victim. And you've just bought up, Doc, you just bought up the police military, too. Like, I've been in a lot of situations where the guy next to me is my partner. I'm like, you know, he's frozen, you know, you ready to go here. Um, so it, it ha I don't care about your training. This, some people are just going to freeze in certain moments and uh, the training may not matter. It may mean everything, you know, but not for a young girl. Obviously, we've never had it. Counselor Carson, one of the things that really got to me as the father of two young girls and a young son says, uh, Kernodal's cellular phone indicated she was likely awake and using TikTok at approximately 4, 12 a.m. My, my daughters are on TikTok way more than they should be, even though I yell at them for it. Um, but if you are defending this suspect in a court of law, which is your expertise, and I'm a juror, and I'm looking at this guy, there's just such an element of innocence and humanity. A young college woman you know, on TikTok, suddenly her life is taken away from her. Um, just curious what your thoughts are on, on this council. Well, I have thoughts about that, but let me mention Dr. Is it Shiloh? Did I, did Shiloh. I yep. Shiloh. That was the best explanation of human response to threat that I have ever heard. So I hope that you maintain that, memorialized it somehow in this recording, because I need a copy of that. It's on <laughs> Surviving the Survivor, man, the hottest <laughs> podcast in America right now. That, that was really spectacular. Thank you for that. And I want to mention something that we probably are not thinking about. This is a probable cause affidavit. When I used to write probable cause affidavits, they don't have any part of it that tends to minimize the offender's behavior. So what they're seeing here is they're cherry picking out what this girl did and how she responded. It may well have been that she thought it was another boyfriend up there with these other individuals. So to castigate her for going back to her room and closing the door really is inconsistent with the way it probably played out, but it is promoted in the arrest affidavit simply because they're trying to prove a point. And we needn't forget that. That's certainly an argument that I've often used in defense work with my clients. Because all the, the, and I tell all of my clients this while we're on the subject, police reports are nothing more than the elements of the crime and why somebody should be arrested. They're not any mitigation. They're not an editorial about that evening or someone's past history. It's none of that. So she's probably being unfairly criticized because people don't understand the function of an affidavit for a probable cause arrest. So again, there's a whole lot laying back here that we haven't seen yet and likely will not see at all. I mean, I don't see any reference to the use of stingers in this operation. I don't see any use of aircraft in this operation. And I know all of that was being used. This was a high profile case. The FBI was involved in it from the outset, essentially. and it turned out very successfully, but it's a coordinated effort because law enforcement have the skills and the technologies available to perform these tasks seamlessly. I mean, years ago, we didn't even have communications with local law enforcement. Now there's a connection for every FBI office to be connected directly to law enforcement. So not in anticipation of these things, but as law progressed, we got better at coordinating with one another because no police, no FBI, no U.S. Marshal can be every place, every moment. So it really expands the ability of law enforcement to respond to these horrible crimes. Dr. Shiloh, this is perhaps the most haunting part of this affidavit. Uh, Dylan Mortensen, the roommate who survived, then said she heard a male voice say something to the effect of and I quote, it's OK, I'm going to help you. That is presumably uh, the alleged killer, Brian Koberger. Uh, gives me chills just saying it. Um, what must have that must have that been like 
uh, for Dylan. I, you know, I'm sure she was just so upside down, not knowing what to make of this. I mean, it, it's very chaotic. You have the report of right at four o'clock, the DoorDash being delivered, right? So there's already someone who's been there. And then within minutes, this other stuff is starting to happen. She's hearing thuds upstairs. She's hearing dogs barking. She's hearing these voices. So I can't imagine what she's trying to make sense of because that's what our brain wants to do, right? Is like, okay, how can I explain this away? Something that makes sense and that's something that's, you know, not gonna hopefully cause me any harm. And then you hear something like that and it's sort of conflicting, right? It's not, you know, I'm gonna harm you or, you know, some expletives or something violent. It's it's this this sentence of I'm here to help you. And so it had to be incredibly confusing to her. And now for us, in hindsight, it's absolutely chilling because is this his way to calm down one of the victims after he's already hurt one of the others? And if one of them is waking up to this, how disorienting that must be to them um, to where he's trying to placate someone to then harm them further. Doc, can you explain this in the nature of normalcy bias? I think everybody would appreciate that analysis. I mean, well, we Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. W explain which part in terms of normalcy, normalcy bias. bias, where we've never had that happen before. It can't be anything bad. Yeah. So you're, you know, our brains kind of <laughs> go through little shortcuts in life to quickly take in all the stimuli that we're moving through every single day. Um, so we have we have these heuristics, these shortcuts, and ways that our brains think. And if you hear something, especially middle of the night, if you've been sleeping again, you don't have all of your um, wits about you necessarily, your cognitive functioning is kind of low, your brain's going to jump through some of these little shortcuts. And to hear some things like that, you might be trying to fit it into a narrative that feels normal. And we don't know what's normal for that household anyway. You know, are people coming right. and going? Right through, you know, hours of the night or friends stopping over, DoorDash being delivered at four in the morning, you know, that's probably pretty normal for them. So it's, it again, I think it just comes back to being like really disorienting to size up what's happening in that house. I think in the affidavit, it actually says that Maddie Mogan ordered food around 4 a.m. Yeah. Um, to your point. Um, John, um, I, as a dog lover, there was a little justification all along. We heard this dog didn't make a peep in the affidavit. It says the dog was barking at 4 17 AM, perhaps trying to protect its um, owners. Um, this is another question, obviously that we've sort of uh, glossed over any thoughts as why, as to why he spared the two surviving roommates. Yeah. Um, I think it's a mystery. You know, he eyed, um, you know, in the affidavit, he talks about you know, there's eye contact between the two. And we know that, you know, uh, Dylan went back to her room. We just discussed that and nothing happened to her. So, you know, was he fixated going going back to another typology other than, the you know, the warrior sort of mindset? But was he a, was he fixated on one of them? Um, and, you know, after, again, the the deed is done, he decides to leave, perhaps. And the other two weren't part of his fixation. Again, um, we don't know that. And perhaps um, that's that's part of it for him. You know, with, with the, I mean, he, they weren't a focal point for his um, his fixation. So, yeah, it's a great unknown. That's a good question. I, I can't answer it. Dr. Shiloh, since you are the uh, psychologist here, will I spare the two others? Yeah, I almost wonder if, you know, he had a very uh, fixed plan. Um, and that by the time he was finished upstairs, that that was it. Like it's a, I know this sounds crass in the terms of it, but he was satiated in that, that moment. Like that was what he came to do and he was done. Um, you know, I, I think to Dale's point, you know, he might not have even known that the two that lived downstairs were there and they just weren't part of that plan. Um, but we also can't. I think throw out the sense that maybe he was just sort of dissociating in to some extent after committing the initial crimes where he was in a fugue or he was in a fog afterwards, just, okay, it's time to get out, 
even though he made eye contact with another human being. Um, and I don't mean dissociating in any terms of, you know, trying to say that there are some psychotic symptoms or, um, you know, delusions going on here that impact the crimes or motivations, but just after experiencing a trauma, which even though he caused the trauma, we still have to say that he experienced it as well himself. That could be a result of that. A couple more quick points for the uh, lawyer, um, Gail Carson, and then we'll take some viewer questions and comments, final thoughts, and we'll wrap this up. But um, the Gonzalez family counselor, uh, who have been vocal, did not speak today at this initial hearing. They were at the court. Um, the lawyer for the family did speak and basically issued a very terse statement saying that it's a very difficult time for the family uh, because they had to see the defendant uh, for the very first time. Uh, so just to that point, uh, in your own experience, how difficult is it uh, for families to see the perpetrator in court? Well, this may surprise you, but I often represent uh, victims in crimes because the criminal justice system is kind of harsh generally. And the result is that oftentimes victims are not as forthcoming as they need to be to secure convictions. And I think Dr. Shiloh can probably speak to this. I think anytime we encounter a system that we're unfamiliar with, it's kind of daunting. So in a situation like this, where you have a lawyer who was interfacing previously with law enforcement, that seemed to calm the family down, which is precisely what you want. The family has a right to know, but they have a right to know on a timely basis related to what we now know was a progressing investigation that was going to identify and ultimately charge the actual perpetrator here. So I think families have a tough time, and I don't think it's ever over for them. It's a constant, I had a, a woman whose hair was pulled out by an armed robber. And when she pointed that out to the, the lady judge, he got a maximum sentence. So that's the kind of thing that good attorneys can orchestrate for their clients, whether it's as a defense attorney or as someone who is providing a safe environment for victims to testify and provide witness to the government or at a trial. And counselor, we also learned today that the defense team, they hired a veteran Washington state crime reconstruction expert, a guy named Matthew Nodal, and he's already spent five hours inside uh, that 1122 King Road home. Uh, what is he doing in there right now? Or, well, he's looking. Or he to, well, this is a typical behavior for defense attorneys. We do it here all the time. You're trying to determine whether or not the affidavit supporting the original arrest or the affidavit supporting searches was accurate. Could the individual actually have encountered that individual on the second area and in the kitchen near the sliding glass doors. I don't know, I haven't been in the house, but those are the kinds of things that they're looking to determine. Was that sheath actually found where the investigator said it was found? Is there not a bed in that room? And that's another issue. The effort of law enforcement in Idaho to turn over the crime scene quickly was sort of amazing to me. Because I think the marshal will agree, John, that, that you don't turn over a crime scene like that. And it's stunning to me that anyone would ever want to live there again. And I, I would think, frankly, that that structure ought to be destroyed, given its history. Yeah, I, I would agree with that for sure. Uh, Dr. Shiloh, um, you pointed out uh, that you do not think this is incel motivated. Um, your reasoning for that? Yeah, a little bit what I alluded to before when we were just talking about uh, targeted violence. But again, you know, the incel ideology is very grievance holding and they tend to commit crimes, which is very rare for the, the overall population as we know it of incels. And actual real academic research is finally starting to come out, which is wonderful. Um, but it, it's very rare for them to act out violently. But when they do, it tends to be mass casualty events. Um, again, 
there is um, usually the the goal of getting their message out where there's a legacy token like a manifesto or a video uploaded and left behind. And generally they're planning that they're going to die. They are absolutely suicidal, um, hoping that they'll die in suicide by cop or will take their own lives. At the end of this, they generally don't, again, want to sneak out under the cover of night and get away with this and drive across country and leave the world thinking, oh, what happened here? So as of right now, <laughs> I don't have any indication that this is an incel um, perpetrated crime. If, you know, if the, I know there's been rumors about bullying and, and some witness statements about bullying in high school that does not equate in seldom. Um, and again, just, you know, we know that overwhelmingly people who subscribe to this ideology are not the ones acting out violently, but unfortunately when they do it, it usually is big numbers of casualties. John, to you, uh, as a formal marshal, are you proud of law enforcement? Uh, Moscow PD was taking a lot of heat. Uh, people were like, what's going on? The clock is ticking. Uh, it was seven weeks, I believe, uh, in a day or two, they got their uh, alleged suspect. Um, is this yeah. a good day they, for law enforcement? I think it's a great day for law enforcement. The coordination, the detective work, as I mentioned when we began the podcast, uh, I think it's a, I think it's a phenomenal um detective work and you know unfortunately we all live in a society that you know we need instant gratification we watch the tv show and the case it begins and ends within a half hour or an hour that's not real life it takes weeks and months these in the affidavit it talks about pen registers um these things take a long time there's a system that has to you know that has to be abided by for law enforcement to get court orders and wait for information from cell phone provider. So there is a process out there that um, is not the television, right? It's not a movie. So um, I think we see at the end here, although it was seven weeks, when, even within the, you know, the, the 15 pages of the affidavit, we see a heck of a lot of really good, really great law enforcement work and collaboration amongst federal, state, and local authorities. So good job. It's amazing how many uh, law enforcement officials I've heard say this is not like a TV show or movie. We should start making movies seven weeks long and then people yeah. get used to it. Um, let's move on to some questions and comments. First one for the counselor comes from Ariana Hernandez. Is this enough for a first degree capital murder? They don't specify DNA was blood or a connection to victims. Hope this family might talk now after learning all this. Well, provided there is in Florida, I can speak to that, there's got to be a heinous component to the crime. Clearly, that's evident here. I mean, you have mass casualties, and you have very... The question is, did the victim suffer? And I can tell you, based on what little I know here, the victims suffered. And that is one of the key pathways to a capital offense, meaning they can be put to death based on this. But again, this is just a probable cause affidavit. All it's doing is putting forth the reasons that support the elements to the crime. Who, what, when, where, how, why. Not why, because we don't know that yet. But those elements of the crime are what allow law enforcement to go forward and make an arrest. And now there's an investigation that's going to transpire. And that investigation may take several months. It's not unusual in Florida for prosecutions in a murder case to take well over a year to even be initiated. So this is just the very beginning. We're going to learn a lot more. People knowing his name, knowing the car that he was in, all of those are leads that will cause people to go, you know what, I remember that. You know, I'm going to call about that and provide law enforcement with even further details. And so I would expect over the next six months or so, this is going to flesh itself out in a way that we will know who he was. If he's convicted, we're going to know who he was, what was going on in his mind. I have often thought, frankly, that there's a possibility. Look at what he did. OK, he was in psychology. Then he was in law enforcement, education I'm talking about. Is it possible? A lot of academics 
talk about crimes and these kinds of things, but they've never committed a crime and they've never been there. What a great way to promote yourself ultimately as being a killer who actually engaged in that activity and has a PhD in criminal justice. And I have seen in the past circumstances similar to that, not exactly the same, but similar. So that would not surprise me. Interesting. Almost like an arsonist that goes back to the scene of the crime. Yes, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, it's a really good point. Exactly right. Or and arsonists it, that turn out to be firefighters. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. There you go. Yes. Interesting. Next comment comes from Chico's Mummy, who's a uh, friend and fan of the show. Uh, we'll toss this to you, Dr. Shiloh. We kind of went over this, but curious about one thing here. I hope I'm wrong, she writes, but rather than killed in their sleep, it seems they had to face him. He was heard saying, it's okay, I'm going to help you. What on earth? This is terrifying. I can't think straight after reading that. Um, this is very shocking to the public at large. Um, I know I was nervous in my own bed last night, um, you know, covering this, thinking, hey, you know, and I live in a pretty safe community. Um, but what about the fact that, um, you know, we kept hearing they were asleep, they were asleep, they were asleep, and now it appears that uh, several of them may have been awake when confronted with this guy. Yeah, I think hearing that they were asleep, given such a horrific situation, maybe gave us a little bit of solace that they weren't conscious enough to suffer so much. Um, so hearing this is is really jarring. Um, and I, I think it has to be the case because if you, again, you look at that, we're looking at like 16 minutes that his car got there and left the area. So we're talking a quick window of time and from all indications, you know, with the TikTok use, it looks like that, you know, we're looking at more like an eight minute window in which this really happened. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it is just really, really jarring to folks when you think that you're safe. And, you know, I can't imagine those of you that have kids that are college age and sending them off and, you know, how that resonates with all of this. Um, it just hits home in those core values that we think we should be safe in our own home. Yeah. I, and if I could just jump in on that as a, a follow-up, um, when I hear when when you read the affidavit and you read the, what he had, presumably it was him who said those words, it's okay. I think, you know, my first thought was power dominance, mm -hmm. um, just to dominate that that victim um, and have that person know that. Um, but I'm reminded of, and I this is a shameless plug, but I I do work for Gavin De Becker. Um, he has a great book out there called The Gift of Fear. And for the person who wrote that to you, um, I recommend that she pick up the book. Um, and there's uh, there's information online called Gift of Fear. You can see uh, there's videos about the book and, and women and men who have been attacked and stalked. But um, when I think of the terms, the words, and the situation, I'm, I think of Gavin's book, Gift of Fear, and I think of intuition, and I think of uh, that that type of uh, individual that he writes about in that book, um, and, and uh, you know what you could do as a, to not be a victim um, in those sort of, sort of situations. Yeah, absolutely. My father bought me that book when I turned eighteen, and it was changed my life. Well, you should read a rust proof yourself. But here's that very book you're talking about, and it's a really excellent read for people who. Can well, I got one too. There you go. Oh, Gavin De Becker better come on my podcast now. <laughs> I'd have to leave this room to go get mine. <laughs> so we all so, have it. Counselor, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna combine two comments. We'll go through another one or two and then we'll let you guys have a final thought. Uh combining one from foot of mountain, foot to mountain. Uh they write, looks like a guaranteed conviction, exclamation mark onto Captain Crunch, who writes. This trial is going to be awful in regards to what is revealed. I find it immensely frustrating that if he's convicted, he'll just rot there. This killer should remain in a constant state of physical misery as a proper punishment for his heinous crimes. Uh, there's no such thing as a guaranteed conviction, is there? No, there's not. I mean, you could literally have one holdout juror 
a couple of times and the state would have to change the case. And we don't know right now. Look, it's easy to say this is the guy. I mean, you could say, I don't have to worry about it anymore. He's in custody. I'm not going to worry about this anymore. But the truth of the matter is, until you're charged with a crime, you're not in a position to assess whether or not the term innocent until proven guilty means anything. We sit in our houses and, and we're all safe and well and nothing bad. Can We're not going to do anything bad. So we look at people who've been accused of crimes and we just immediately go, the police wouldn't arrest them if they weren't responsible for the crime. And that's not true. Law enforcement occasionally make errors. I mean, we see this when individuals who are serving death penalties get exonerated because the DNA evidence was either concealed or not available 20 years ago. So to assume that somebody is clearly guilty without a trial, without the presentation of evidence that was properly gathered, you can't just jump in and say, nah, he's the one. Because if you do, and he's not the one, that means somebody else who is the one is still out there. A final comment and then uh, closing remarks. This one comes from JM Tab. A quadruple, Dr. Shiloh, we'll send this to you first. A quadruple murder seems to be a very significant first kill. Do they think, meaning you, the panel, has he killed previously? And there's a follow up that they share my opinion he would have undoubtedly killed again. I'll get all your opinions on this, Dr. Shiloh, first. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree that it is very unusual to be a first um, for someone who's committed homicide. Um, however, I think it is. I think he was someone, someone that was extremely organized and planned and clearly studied. Um, so given his background does not does not surprise me. Um, would he have gone on to do this? Who's to say? I mean, we're not very good predictors of human behavior. Um, even after working in violence risk assessment for many years, um, I'll be the first to say that we're just not great at it. But um, I think, you know, this could have been as gross as it sounds, his ultimate case study. And he could have gone on to, you know, continue his studies and, um, take this experience under his belt and do what he wanted with it. Wow. John, do you think uh, he's killed before or would have continued to kill? I'm in agreement with uh, Dr. Shiloh. I, I think it's easy to jump to conclusions um, like, you know, he did it before or he was going to do it later. I mean, it is a predictor of, you know, past behavior is a predictor of future behavior. So yeah, sure. Therefore could have been, and, but I think the kind of the amateurness of his 12 times, at least prior to being in that neighborhood, using his own personal vehicle, I think that is an indicator, too, of perhaps this was his first time, because um, if, if, if it was his second time or third time, he didn't learn to cover his tracks very well, um, you know, going into this event. And uh, counts, are they looking at unsolved homicides, particularly in Pennsylvania right now in the Pocono region? And do you think he's killed or would have killed again? Yeah, I, you know, I love your panel. I mean, those are the exact things that, that I would promote uh, as, first off, it's very amateurish. You go into the place with your cell phone engaged 12 times is just purely stupid. I mean, you'd have to know today that if you have your cell phone with you, you can be tracked. I mean, that's just a no brainer with children today in their technology or young people. So there's no question that that's amateurish. And then turning your phone off and not leaving it on back in uh, the other state, the other uh, WSU, you know, is just silly. What, how, how would you not think that through? But I agree with um, Dr. Silo that that he's organized and he's planned his life forward toward this point. I mean, he was trying to be an expert and help law enforcement in the local area. And he put his application out to be basically a part-time assistant to that 
organization to help them with forensics and those kinds of things. I mean, the guy has a methodology. And I would agree entirely that this is his first encounter with this situation. I would also agree that in the encounter with the surviving witness, that she just didn't understand what was going on because you wouldn't. How would you possibly believe that something like this horrible like this would happen? There's no history of anything like that in that environment. So I feel poorly for the in woman, the, the young lady who's being castigated about this by not calling the police earlier and those kinds of things. Clearly, she didn't understand what was going on, and that's not her fault. But I would think probably... Will he do this again? I've told you that I think he was doing this in order to extend his own profession. He'd have a PhD in in criminal justice, and he would have the inside track on why people do what they do, how they do it, those kinds of things, and memorialize it in a way that would make him a historical figure. So maybe that has something to do with incels. I don't know that much about them in terms of wanting to memorialize themselves in a way to have a permanent place in history. But maybe Dadak could could explain that if it's true. Yeah, we, we haven't seen that. Well, I mean, more to move the movement forward rather than themselves. And then they start sort of idolizing each other as they, you know, continue down the line um, and seeing each other as sort of these patron saints of the cause more than anything. But, um, you know, there's, we're, we're finding out with the data now, there's just so much depression and low self-esteem with these individuals that it's not sort of that narcissistic, Hey, look at me, um, sort of trope that you're talking about there. Fascinating. We'll take some very fascinating. We'll take some uh, closing comments. John Muffler, the man without the tie, is principal of Equitas Global Security, was in law enforcement for 28 years and is a former former U.S. marshal. Uh, one thing I thought was interesting, John, I think someone uh, at the jail was asked about his vegan meals and they said, well, we'll try to provide them, but we're certainly not getting him new pots and pans, which... Uh, could set off an individual like that, um, from what we're told. But where do you see uh, this investigation headed? Um, I mean, again, I just we we discuss we discussed a lot, and there's still a lot to learn. Um, you know, because it is you know just an affidavit. More to come, but you know, it stands the reason from what we're seeing that this. Seems like a pretty easy case for the prosecution. Uh, but again, as uh, a counselor was discussing, there is um, many things that could uh, be found along this investigation. But I, I, I you know, I think it's uh, I think it's a great case as far as moving it uh, through the system. And, um, you know, I, I don't I don't see any other outcome than most people are probably thinking. Dr. Chilo has the sleekest background in all of podcasting. She is a forensic and police psychologist, a former police officer, and hosts the very popular podcast, L.A. Not So Confidential. Doctor, uh, what else would you like to find out in the coming days and weeks? Um, again, I think I'm going to reiterate that I would love to know more about why these victims were targeted. Why yeah. them? You know, as Dale was speaking about, was there a parasocial relationship sort of curated through online means? Um, was it a random interaction that then had him laser focused on this group? Um, or was there something more personal? So I, I think that will connect a lot of dots of curiosity for folks. Um, and as sort of final comments on that, you know, I think it's it's absolutely normal and natural to be curious about this and to want to know more. And we just need to be tactful in the way that we do this, especially with true crime being such a genre of media these days that please hold the victims in your hearts first, whether it's um, the actual victims or the surviving victims left behind um, and all the families that are really living this day in and day out, as well as as a police psychologist working with law enforcement day after day, you know, the, the 
people in the criminal justice system that are being exposed to these traumas, whether they're reading it or whether they're a crime scene tech or photographer, you know, there are some folks that are doing this work for their daily life that is trauma day in and day out. And, you know, there's someone for everything um, that's cut out to do every type of work. And I'm so grateful for them um, and all of their hard work. It's really shown very well, I think, in this affidavit of just the wonderful detective work at the local level and then the resources and the technology they tapped into with the state and the feds, just remarkable. That is why I'm a big fan of law enforcement. Last but certainly not least, distinguished Dale Carson has done it all. Miami-Dade County police officer where I live in Miami-Dade, special agent of the FBI, went on to become an attorney, and he's also an author of Arrest Proof Yourself, the indispensable guide to avoiding unnecessary arrests and interactions with police. From your uh, defense attorney lens, what are you looking for, counselor? Well, I, you obviously look for mistakes. So you're going to be looking closely at the DNA to see if the actual match is a valid match. Those are the kind of things you're going to be concerned about. And remember this, that the location of the actual DNA is something that's transportable. Somebody could have left that there, not necessarily this individual. So those are always possibilities that defense attorneys like myself look at and analyze because he may not be guilty. And to promote the idea that this is the only guy who possibly could have done this may not be a service to any of us if the real killer is still out there. And uh, Dale Carson so eloquently said that he loves the panel. That's because we have the best guests in all of true crime podcasting, perhaps in podcasting uh, as a whole. And you're seeing why today with this exceptional panel on Saturday, we'll be back with your Saturday true crime Phil FIL with detective Phil Waters of the Houston PD that's worked, I believe, 500 homicides. He'll give us his take. We'll be back soon enough enough with another episode of Survive and Survivor. Love you, America. 